Okay, it appears most of you have come in from the waiting room. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to another board leadership lunch and learn. I'm Brian Jordan, the deputy executive director here at the Kansas Association of School Boards. And also with us today is one of our staff attorneys, Sam Blasey. And then we have a special team with us today uh, that is the Kansas COVID work group for kids. And so they're going to be obviously be the main focus of our conversation as we go throughout this session today. A couple of quick updates before we jump into the work group's information. Uh, you may or not have been following yesterday, the State Board of Education uh, had a waiver of the 1116 hour requirement for student learning time. They had that as a conversation uh, at the board meeting yesterday and they did uh, approve a waiver to those 1116 hours. Of course, there are a few conditions uh, connected to that waiver. Uh, if a school is requesting a waiver from the 1116 hours, they have to schedule and use that, uh, those hours between December 1st and April 30th. Those hours will transition from student learning time to what we would call professional learning time or teacher conferences or training for staff time. Uh, the 1116 hours are student contact time. So um, the state board uh, is waiving up to 20 hours or will allow you to waive up to 20 hours if you're waiving the time and using it for staff development, as you see there in the third bullet, staff collaboration, parent-teacher conferences, uh, assistance to teachers and other staff. So that's one important update for you to uh, kind of have on your radar. I'm sure your, your school boards will be talking about that in the coming weeks of how to, how to apply for that waiver and, and get that time. Part of the rationale behind this was a lot of school districts when the pandemic hit, shifted a, their professional learning time or professional development time from later in the year or spread out through the year to the beginning of the year to try to gear up for hybrid learning models or remote learning. And so the state board in their discussion yesterday indicated that this would be a great way uh, to, to backfill some of that professional learning time that's necessary to adjust uh, now that we're into the uh, school year and, and have been doing hybrid or remote or a combination of those things. The other piece that I wanted to update on and, and the team that's with us today is, has a lot more insight and information related to this than I probably can share here on this brief slide. Uh, but the State Board of Education also approved an update to the Navigating Change document. Uh, they provided a recommendation uh, that all elementary and pre-K students should be on site. Uh, and a couple of caveats with that, they're, they're recommending that these students are on site even if the community spread is such that, uh, that you're not supposed to be on site. So we know that a lot of districts are operating with gating criteria and that gating criteria sets thresholds uh, this most recent update says for, for, this for these grade levels of students, we want them back on site because our data indicates that uh, zero to nine year olds are not as susceptible uh, and only 3.2% of the cases in Kansas uh, are falling within that age range. And for the social, emotional and benefits for our students, it's better to have them on site. Of course, if they're on site, they have to be wearing masks and they have to be following social distance. So again, that will be probably some ongoing conversation that you're having around your board tables here in the coming weeks about this recommendation and update to the navigating change document. So that actually is a perfect segue then into uh, introducing our speakers for today. And, and the person that we reached out to and made contact with is Dr. Stephanie Kuhlman. She's a pediatric specialist at Wesley's Children Hospital. Uh, she was one of the leaders of the team that worked with uh, KSDE to put together the Navigating Change document. Uh, of course, their goal as they worked with KSDE was to identify, address, and provide guidance on the physical and social and psychological impacts of, on children as we go through this pandemic. So uh, they are the folks that have continued to work with KSDE and provide guidance to them. Uh, and, and hopefully you have some questions for them today as it relates to uh, where we're at currently and, and what are some next steps that districts need to be considering. We will be taking questions uh, at, as we go through this, but we will reserve those questions to be asked at the end so that we can get through their presentation. Uh, you may also notice some KSDE staff that are present on this, um, on this Zoom meeting. And we're going to direct our questions to the, the COVID uh, work group team uh, KSD is not going to be fielding questions today. There's, there's, uh, they have a state board meeting going on, and so there's some other things. Uh, so we want to keep the questions focused with uh, the work group that's on here. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to 
Dr. Stephanie Kuhlman, and she's going to take the, take the lead from here. Dr. Kuhlman. Okay, thank you, Dr. Jordan, for the introduction, um, and thank you for the invitation to present um, to you guys today. I'll um, introduce my team here in just a little bit. Well, I'll do it now, I guess. I have a slide introducing them, but um, we have Dr. Um, Christy Darnauer from Lyons, Kansas, um, Dr. Carrie Harris from um, KU Pediatric Wichita, yeah. Director of Adolescent Medicine, and Dr. Paul Turan from KU Pediatrics Wichita, Director of Education. And I failed to mention that Dr. Darnauer is the uh, a medical consultant there in her county as well. So um, definitely. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and screen share here and we'll get started with our presentation. Um, and as they stated, we have a um, kind of a PowerPoint presentation to share with you guys today. Um, and then we'll um, allow some time for question and answers. So just a reminder who we are, Kansas COVID Worker for Kids um, is a uh, non ad hoc, non political group of um, physicians, both pediatricians and family medicine specialists, many of who are um, um, county health officers and their or consultants in their uh, local areas and communities. Uh, we have mental health professionals on our team, school nurses, school psychologists, or school counselors, excuse me. Um, and I think we span throughout the state from um, Garden City all the way to Kansas City. Um, we have representation um, kind of throughout the state. I think more importantly, though, many of us are, are parents. Um, many of us are, um, some of us are school board members. And I think the vast majority are, well, all of us are um, engaged in our community and in, in, in um, Kansans, fellow Kansas to all of you guys. So we feel very um, passionate to um, be able to do the work we're doing and very honored and humbled to be able to serve our state and the children in it. As Dr. Jordan alluded, our work group, um, again, was established to identify and address and provide guidance on the uh, physical, social, and emotional um, impacts that this pandemic is having on children and youth in our communities and to provide education around that. So just always want to make sure our, our mission is first and foremost um, for you guys. Um, again, here's who I have um, on the call today, Dr. Darnauer, Dr. Harris, and Dr. Tran, and you will um, get to listen to all of them speak and share with you today. Um, just to kind of go through what our goals are today, we want to provide an update of um, what we're seeing in our communities related to COVID, um, and then talk about the impact COVID has um, on children, um, on our schools, um, on our mental health, and then identify or uh, make sure that we all understand the importance of risk mitigation procedures um, in our communities and in our school systems and discuss ways that we um, can further support schools, teachers, students, and school administrators. So I'll kind of start this um, off just talking about COVID impact that we're seeing in our hospital. Um, this will be a uh, Wichita perspective as that's the hospital that I work in and um, in Wichita, and although it is a Wichita perspective, I think um, we're seeing this um, across all communities and um, even across the country in many, um, many areas. So in Wichita specifically, um, we are at our peak numbers since this pandemic started back in March and our hospitals have reached critical capacity. Uh, we have implemented um, several surge plans and continue um, to expand into additional units and open up additional units to take care of COVID um, patients. And when we do that, that does mean that um, we have unit creep into other units and that um, um, allows us less space to be able to take care of um, traumas, um, other medical conditions such as heart attacks, strokes, um, diabetes complications, et cetera. Um, and even within our hospital, our pediatric units have been um, overtaken to some extent with adult patients. So um, it, please, you do not want us as pediatricians taking care of you when you come in. Um, but unfortunately, that's, <laughs> that is what's um, now starting to happen. So we're not trained to take care of adults. We're trained to take care of children. Um, the patients in the hospital are very, very sick. Uh, many of them are, um, especially those in our ICU setting. They're requiring um, extensive um, critical care support and hospital resources. Um, so taking up lots of resources. We're dealing with um, staffing shortages within the hospital. Um, this is um, due to 
um, a lot of times illness. Um, with our high community transmission rates, uh, many of our staff have um, unfortunately succumbed to the virus itself and have been out on medical leave. Um, and that expands anywhere from physicians to nurses to respiratory therapists. I think our nursing um, certainly has taken the brunt, brunt of that. Um, and many nurses and physicians and everybody are working um, extra hours and overtime and extra shifts. So there's a lot of just fatigue and exhaustion and, um, and just the overall burnout and emotional impact that it's having on our frontline workers. Um, the, when we talk about these patients, they do require, again, a very specialized team to really optimize their care. Um, that's certainly critically care trained physicians and pulmonologists, um, critically care trained nurses. And then a lot of people just think that that really stops at the front line of physicians and nurses, but it's really our respiratory therapists, our pharmacists. Um, these patients require proning and turning and mobilization. And so our um, physical therapists and occupational therapists assist with that. Um, several of them end up needing tracheostomies and um, learning how to talk and swallow again once they're recovered. So speech therapists, um, certainly our um, chaplains are there to help with the emotional support, case managers to help with long-term placement. So some of these um, uh, uh, patients and then our um, other service lines such as our phlebotomists who do lab draws, our radiology techs, our um, housekeepers, environmental service personnel. So there's just a great span of um, of, of the team that goes into taking care of these of these patients and in really any patient in the hospital. So I just want to point that out that there's just a it's a it's a it's a big team. Um, but what we're seeing with with this is the teams are stretched, um, the staff is stretched, and so that really impacts the care that the hospital um, is um, able to deliver throughout the hospital. Um, our hospital has applied for um, emergency response travelers, especially in, in nursing, respiratory therapy, and uh, physicians. Um, but as you guys know that this pandemic is not um, isolated to Wichita, certainly. It's not isolated to the state of Kansas. It's a, it's a nationwide and worldwide pandemic. So there's just a uh, shortage everywhere in, in these type of skilled um, medical professionals. And um, it's just a finite area of resources available to us. Um, talking about supply capacity, um, I was on a call this morning and we are out of our first line ventilators actually in the hospital. So our ventilators as of today are at capacity. They're having to transition some long-term um, patients onto um, kind of two, two, two or three ventilators. And what that means is it's not the frontline ventilators that our medical teams are used to, to working with really. And so um, when you have people that aren't as familiar with those ventilators or really understand how to run them well, that also leads to um, perhaps some error, medical errors and in, um, it, it impacts the uh, quality of care. Um, we're also running short on uh, different medications and, and other equipment needed. So I think it, the other impact we see is our hospital um, is being is um, on and off train, what we call transfer closure. So being able to take transfers from critical access hospitals from throughout our state. Um, and I'll let Dr. Darnar talk a little bit more about that from the critical access hospital perspective. But um, so it's certainly a challenge for these tertiary care hospitals to be able to effectively um, provide care um, and, and take referrals from out of town. Whoops, I apologize. Um, and I think the other thing too that you have to um, understand is just the, again, the severe, the severely critical nature of these patients and just the overall death burden. So you're talking about critically ill, Ill patients that um, ICU doctors and pulmonologists are used to seeing. They're used to facing death and they see death, but not in the sheer volume that they're facing right now. And that's just really taken an impact on, the, on their emotional and psyche. And um, it's just, it's been very um, difficult for them. And then you also have to look at the hardships that families are having. And um, I hope that none of you guys have had to experience um, loss due to COVID. I, I, uh, and I'm certainly empathize and I'm sorry if you do, but um, it's just, it's, it's very difficult, especially with these patients in the hospital because they don't have family to support them at the bedside. Um, so I wanted to just emphasize all of that, and I know that's kind of a tough way to start this presentation, but um, we really just wanted to um, 
kind of help people understand what we're seeing um, in the front lines. And this slide is um, a very frontline perspective. So you can say on this call, you're just a pediatrician, you're not the front lines and, and I get it, but these are um, uh, used with permission from some of my fellow colleagues who are taking care of a patients in the front lines. And this was screenshots um, used off of their social media campaigns. And you can see, um, you can see over here, we just finished the worst hospital rotation we've gone through together since we started working together in 2014. I had the worst individual day of my career. And you can see over here, I just finished eight straight days of taking care of COVID patients in the hospital, feeling exhausted. And um, I can't read it because my picture's in the way, but basically it talks about that this was the worst week that this physician has had in 14 years of practicing uh, medicine. And she had to tell, I, I believe um, seven, had nine or seven deaths of, of patients in that week and just how heartbreaking that is. And this is a note that um, she comments at the end. This was a note in a plastic bag from a patient that said, I'm done can, asking for his family to come in. So he had given up. So I think just really understanding the impact that, that's been seen at the front line. So I'm gonna transition over to Dr. Darnauer to, to kind of give a rural perspective. Thank you, Stephanie. That made me feel really emotional. <laughs> um, I'm Dr. Christy Darnauer. I um, work in Rice County, Kansas, which is about, uh, it's in the middle of the state. You know, if you fold the map, we're right in the middle. Um, I work at a critical access hospital and a rural health clinic, um, which is really, my experience is going to be really representative of many um, other small communities across the state in terms of small hospitals um, who heavily rely on our transfer centers. So when um, they asked me to give the rural perspective, the first thing I said is it's bad. It's really bad out here. Um, the goal of a critical access hospital in general in the medical system is to stabilize and ship critically ill patients to bigger hospitals. There are some um, patients that we will keep in our facility um, that we can care for here. Um, and I, I currently have, I have about 10 beds that are my acute care beds. I have eight of them full today. I only have one official COVID room because it requires a special ventilation we call negative airflow. I have three COVID patients admitted. So I have two patients who are in regular rooms, um, potentially um, exposing the rest of our hospital when you think about how that ventilation works. Um, I also have a 15 year old admitted for an overdose today. Um, so this is a really complex problem. Um, and as uh, Dr. Coleman mentioned, it's, it's not all about COVID. It's really um, become a medical system crisis that really started with COVID, but it's complex and has a lot of moving parts and a lot of contributing factors to it. Um, many times in these last few weeks, I've had critically ill patients that I have been unable to find ICU beds for. Um, one of my patients who lives two blocks away from me fell off his roof while he was cleaning his gutters. Uh, he had nine rib fractures. He needed an ICU. He had a broken elbow. He needed surgery. It took us nine hours to find him a bed that was four hours away and we had to fly him there. Um, those kinds of situations are not unique. My experience is not unique. These are the stories that you'll hear across the state. Um, and when you think about, you know, I'm doing, I, I'm taking lots of precautions as an individual and my family's trying to stay safe from COVID you could still fall off a roof and you could still get into a car accident. You could still have a heart attack or a bleeding ulcer. And those are the things that um, we still can't find beds for people to properly care for them. So back to my beginning statement, it's bad. Um, and the situation is just as dire as it's been through this whole pandemic. I don't know who's running the slides. I'm ready for the next one. So after that, I'm just gonna to transition to the focus really of today's talk, which is COVID in children specifically. This is a national perspective and these stats are national. Over 1 million um, confirmed cases now of COVID-19 in children in the US. 
This represents about 12% of all the cases, um, and that number continues to climb. So initially, when we were doing these presentations a few months ago, the number was 7%, um, and now we're up to 12%. Most children with COVID-19 have mild symptoms, cold-like symptoms, um, maybe fever, sniffles, cough, um, but it's all fairly mild. It can, however, cause severe illness in children, but it is rare. And as we see more cases, we continue to see that pattern. Across most of the states, 1.4% um, of all COVID cases in children end up hospitalized, and only 0.01% of all children will die from COVID based on those statistics we've seen so far. In the US, we've had 154 deaths in the pediatric population from COVID-19 this year. Um, and we kind of like to compare things to flu because that's a disease that we have a perspective on. Our highest flu year death was 192, and, and that was actually last year. Um, and so when you compare that, we're already at 154 this year, so we will easily, unfortunately, pass that uh, marker. Children with certain medical conditions do seem to be at higher risk for severe illness, and um, our minority population of children do also see higher numbers of severity um, of illness and death from COVID, and this is most likely due to other um, socioeconomic risk factors that they have. This is the Kansas perspective to give you some numbers of how many cases we have had. Um, 5,000 um, in the zero to nine age group, 10 to 17 year olds, about 12,000, 94 pediatric hospitalizations. Um, deaths in the younger age group have been zero, uh, which is wonderful, but there have been five deaths of people age 18 to 24, which is far too young. We do think, and I know you guys have, have heard this before, and we'll talk um, a little bit with data, that the susceptibility to um, SARS-CoV-2 virus in children seems to be less than, their, than adults. Um, it's difficult to say with certainty um, because we don't have a whole lot of population data to compare it to. It does seem because kids have milder illness that they might sort of fly under the radar with symptoms um, or even be asymptomatic and therefore not get tested and not diagnosed and captured as a case. Um, and they typically children have had in this pandemic a different risk exposure than adults have in that we pulled them out of school initially, they were home most of the summer, um, and so we don't have quite as much data for children as we do for adults in terms of their actual exposure. This is a, a preprint um, study taking into um, using, looking at a lot of different data, um, but indicating that we, what we have thought is that children, again, are not very um, good transmitters of the virus. Um, household studies show that they are, have a lower susceptibility to infection when they're 10 years old and under. Um, and that, that when we take that data and that idea and we apply it to schools, we think that older age group is still a fairly high risk of transmission. So your secondary and high school um, opening can contribute to the spread of SARS-CoV-2. And so if you have an, an in-person situation or even a hybrid situation, um, you have to take into consideration the level of community transmission that you have and implementing all of the safeguards that, um, that we'll talk about later. And then that last statement is the converse, that opening primary schools um, for kids age 10 and under and daycare facilities does seem to um, have a less impact on the community spread of SARS-CoV-2 because they're not great transmitters. Um, and especially if you're implementing smaller class sizes, distancing, masking, and other mitigation measures. I think that the next slides are Dr. Turan. Yeah, so I'm uh, Paul Turan. I'm a pediatric hospitalist at Wesley Children's Hospital in Wichita with KU Pediatrics. And I'm gonna talk specifically more about COVID in schools. And so um, school-based COVID-19 transmission, again, there are limitations every study that we have so far in this pandemic, um, um, but we're trying to get good data out there and find good data from other sources. Um, but 
we're starting to see that in schools with reasonable and really strong risk mitigation efforts, school-based transmission of COVID-19 appears to be relatively low compared to other community transmission. And we're seeing that the young students do have high compliance with those masking, washing your hands, physical distancing, those type of measures that we like to see. Um, but we do know that as the community burden increases, we will have more um, risk for school-based exposure. And, and we're seeing that, and you guys are all seeing it in the communities that you live in. Um, um, because everybody who goes to a school is out in the community. Those teachers are out in the community, uh, the students are. And so there's just more risk of asymptomatic people being in the school or pre-symptomatic people and spreading it. Because although we think that zero to 10 year olds are less of a risk, they are not zero risk. And so that's why um, it is really important to have um, a lot of things put in place. Um, it's impossible to prevent all cases from COVID-19 from entering school, but the goal of these measures are that if um, little Mike or so that's in second grade decides to, or comes to school in that pre-symptomatic stage and doesn't know that he was exposed, that he's six feet away from people at all times, he's washing his hands, he's masked, and all of his classmates and teachers are masked too. So even before he starts developing symptoms, there's a less risk of him transmitting it. And so then, and then we work on the screening and know that he has to know and his parents have to know that when um, he does start having sore throat, runny nose, cough, fever, um, to keep him home um, and know those warning signs. Um, so the primary goal is to make sure that even if there's a chance that somebody comes to school with the illness or risk of transmitting it, we're trying to cut it off there and not have the school-based transmission. You can go to the next slide. Um, we're at a place that our communities are um, in a critical state um, um, from all aspects. And if we close schools to in-person attendance, um, it will not have enough of an effect on the community numbers of COVID to make a great difference and, and change the trajectory of this virus in our, in our city and state. Um, so yes, some schools need to close to in-person attendance, but we also need to um, work together as a community to cut off the transmission in other areas um, and other community activities and other public gatherings and really um, working together um, to do risk mitigation throughout the entire community. The school needs to have teachers, staff, office workers, bus drivers, everybody to be able to function. And what we're seeing in a lot of districts is that um, just getting those exposures from outside of school is limiting and within school, you know, there has been some, some school-based transmission, especially with these higher numbers. Um, we um, don't have enough staff in schools to safely staff it, safely staff it from the, all the safety measures we had before COVID-19, but then also safely staff it in the mindset that we have smaller cohorts and physically distanced. And um, um, so, um, Staffing has been a limitation. You guys know this better than I do. And we have seen in healthcare settings, in school settings, that eating unmasked in common areas is one of the biggest risk factors for spreading it. Because when you maintain those safety measures, um, it does decrease your risk quite a bit, but it's impossible to um, eat unmasked. So, um, and we want to be social, social people. So we need to find ways to really um, cut off the transmission. One of those is not getting together for lunches. So when I talk about universal mitigation measures for schools, you guys have seen these lists, you guys have um, know what it's about, but um, some of them are staff and students staying home when appropriate, some sort of symptom or temp screening, whether by parents, by staff, or, or beforehand, before you come to school, um, frequent hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette, that coughing into your elbow, uh, universal masking for all students, for all staff, physical distancing, modified layouts to rooms, um, cohorting students, alternative schedules or staggering um, the, the flow of students in a school, less use of the common spaces, frequent cleaning and disinfecting, improving our ventilation systems, the food service modifications, uh, adequate testing in our cities and isolation and appropriate quarantines. So I go through that long list and um, you guys have maybe seen a, um, 
a figure like this before, but in healthcare, we talked a lot about the Swiss cheese model um, for quality improvement and patient safety. And especially we use the Swiss cheese model when the end effect is something we at all costs want to prevent. Um, whether it's a patient death from getting the wrong medication in the hospital, like a medication that they're allergic to, right? We don't want that to ever happen in, my, in the hospital. And so if you look at this picture on the uh, far left side, you have the COVID virus little picture icon. And on the far right side, that's what we want to avoid is somebody getting COVID. And when we talk about that long list of mitigation kind of strategies, none of them are perfect by themselves. They all have gaps. So we think about them as slice, like slices of Swiss cheese, which they all have holes in them. But if you line up a lot of slices of Swiss cheese, I've never done this in real life, but here's a picture trying to show me what it'd look like. Um, you might get the virus to pass through one or two of those slices or mitigation um, strategies. Um, but hopefully if you have enough lined up in, the row, in, in a row, there's not gonna be a pathway for that virus to get completely through. Um, not all slices of Swiss cheese or mitigation measures are, are um, created, created equally, but still working together in concert can have a huge effect at preventing that terrible outcome of somebody getting COVID, passing it along, and ultimately getting sick, severely sick, or dying. Um, there have been new adaptations to the Swiss cheese model, and one of those is that um, misinformation um, that we have in some of our communities, um, not understanding kind of CDC guidance or not taking the time to kind of work through these issues um, can actually make those gaps in each layer a little bit bigger. And some people call that the misinformation mouse or something like that, if, but I don't need to stick to this um, figure for everything, but just knowing that um, if you have one or two kids in the, in the school who decide, um, I don't want to mask and I don't want to appropriately mask and I want to convince everybody else to not do that. Or when we're in gym class, we don't need to, or when we're in um, the bathroom, we don't need to, um, or we don't need to wash our hands. And that, as much as we think that that the masking is great, if we're having these gaps in, in, in that measure, then it's going to decrease the efficacy of each kind of measure. So we need to all work together on this. So next, I think this is a slide that you guys have seen. Um, I think PSDE has used it. And I think there's another image too, yeah. And uh, I won't go through this too much, but definitely having masks worn by students and staff from the person who might be carrying COVID and the person who might be at risk of receiving it from somebody, those respiratory droplets. Um, um, if they're masked and six feet, it greatly decreases the risk of getting COVID-19. And so when I talk about some of these uh, um, measures, I wanna just show you some of the proof that they work. And I tried to go quickly on this and uh, my colleagues here know that I love graphs and tables, but I, I won't bore you guys too much today. But this is characterizing um, Tennessee from the beginning of the pandemic or in June to October 20th. So we don't have the last like month and a half of data, but you can see that the far left is in hospitals that serve a, um, counties that have less than 25% of patients under a mask requirement. And on the far right, hospitals that have more mask, take care of populations with uh, more mask requirements. And so the hospitals that um, were hitting capacity and, and much over capacity, even in October, if there wasn't a mask requirement in those counties that they served. And if you go to the far right, um, even with that second wave we were seeing in October, hospitals were doing okay. Now we're at the point that this is now December and even places like Tennessee and, and cities with mass requirements are seeing hospital capacity overrun um, because we haven't put enough safety measures in place. And we know that one community can't be the only people who wear a mask and social distance and, and decrease public activities and things like that. You can go to the next slide. Then this is a CDC report straight from our Kansas data. And if you look at it, that dotted line in the middle is the left is before the state mask mandate and the right is afterwards. And the counties 
that had mask mandates um, um, that were put in place in early July um, are the light blue. And then the darker blue is the counties that never did a mask requirement up through this summer. And so this is when we were seeing a bigger peak in the summer. And so you can see that, you know, some, a lot of the counties that put the mask mandate in place were the counties with some of the highest um, COVID numbers already. But you can see as soon as that was put in place, those counties started seeing decrease, although they had high numbers before that mask mandate when the counties that didn't have mask mandates started seeing an increase and got near to the point that we're having the same kind of case rates in both counties. Um, and so this is another showing that mask work as one of the mitigation measures that we need to do community-wide, um, but we need to put other things in place as well. So I'll go to Dr. Harris for more on mental health. And my unmute. All right. So um, unfortunately, this is not going to get any more upbeat with my topic. But um, my name is Carrie Harris. I'm a pediatrician. I run our adolescent um, section at KU in Wichita. And certainly, although I am out of the hospital, I am seeing um, quite significant effects of the pandemic in my practice, um, with the majority of my visits being visits related to mental health of adolescents. So we know from the data that children's mental health emergency visits are up um, by about 30% since this time last year. Um, and then according to a recent survey that was done this year um, of high school and college students, more than half of them consider themselves moderately, very, or extremely worried about their mental health. Half of them are experiencing anxiety, 35% are experiencing depression, which is up about 10% from baseline prior to the pandemic. 25% know someone who's had suicidal thoughts since the, since the beginning of the pandemic. And 5% have actually attempted suicide. And we know that teen suicide is up from about 8.4 deaths per 100,000 in 2016 to 11.1 per 100,000 in 2020. Next slide, please. So we were already in a mental health crisis with our youth prior to the pandemic and the pandemic has just exacerbated this. And I know that you guys know that because you're seeing it in your schools. Um, mental illness is not dependent on the learning mode. I know a lot of people think that when kids go back to school that's gonna help the mental health and it might, um, but every fall, my hospitalist colleagues have a peak in children that are admitted to the hospital for suicidal um, attempts and I have an increase in, in patients that are seen for mental health needs um, just from going back to school in the fall. So certainly just putting kids back into on-site school is not gonna fix the mental health crisis that we're in. What our recommendations as healthcare providers would be is to encourage these kids to be having their routine well checks. A lot of kids and adults alike have missed routine well visits, um, preventive health visits because of the pandemic. And we really need to get these kids back on schedule of being seen by their primary care physicians um, at least annually. During those annual well visits, uh, we routinely screen for depression and we screen for other mental health needs um, as indicated. So I think it's very important that these kids are receiving their routine health care. We need to make sure that resources are available for crisis support. And there's another slide um, following this with some of those resources. Uh, we need to work with community mental health centers. Um, the ones that are partnering with the school districts have had quite a bit of, of success getting um, kids access to care that they may not have otherwise had access to. Um, one of the things that we really have seen through the pandemic is the benefit of telehealth services. Um, and again, just decreasing one of the barriers to access to care. And so really advocating for continued telehealth services um, throughout next year and, and probably onward. And then supporting parents. Children's mental health is directly tied to their parents' mental health. And so making sure that parents have support in this time of incredible stress um, will definitely help the kids as well. And then we know that over a quarter of a million people have died in our country from COVID-related illnesses. And so really acknowledging that and providing bereavement support to the students and to their families um, for those that have lost loved ones. And then I, I don't like to talk about mental health without talking about resilience. And I think it's very important to build resilience in youth. 
and we need to be honest with the youth. We need to talk about them. We, we don't need to tell them everything is going to get better. I know talking to my 13 year old, you know, she's like, I'm tired of people saying it's almost done or it's going to get better. Like they've said that for months and it's not getting better. So just being honest with them. Um, and then working with the children to teach them how to problem solve so that they can kind of acknowledge their own feelings and have some insight to that and then be able to um, use some coping strategies to feel better. Next slide, please. So these are a couple crisis resources um, and we'll make sure that we get these slides sent out to you um, just so you have these. I think you guys are probably all familiar with the National Suicide Prevention Line. Um, they are moving to a three digit number starting in July of 2022, but for now this is the number that needs to be um, disseminated to students and to families. And then there's a text crisis number as well, which I found um, my patients tend to use um, pretty effectively. They're, they're they're pretty good at texting and so to be able to text when they're having um, a concern is kind of nice so those are a couple resource resources for you to share next slide please so resiliency i think like i said is super important and just some ideas on how to build resiliency um, for children and adolescents really we as adults need to model flexibility and adaptability um, let them know things are changing we know things are changing right i'm sitting next to my third grader uh, right now we all have matching headphones um, so we need to be flexible we need to adapt to what is coming our way as learning modes change and as assignments change just because we start you know one curriculum at the beginning of the year maybe that's not the best for a remote learning a remote learner and so we need to really take that into account we need to allow a space for children to be honest and be able to express their feelings. Um, things that can help just, you know, allow them to do like art, painting, drawing, writing to help express their feelings. You know, some kids are better at even like sending their parents a text on how they're doing rather than really being able to verbalize that. And so um, kind of getting creative with that, but allowing a safe space for children to express their feelings. Validating their disappointment. Um, you know, this kind of stinks. Like, we're all tired of the pandemic. We all want it to be better. We all want to celebrate the holidays like we normally do. Um, and so validate that, you know, we're disappointed too, and it's, it's okay to feel that way. And don't rush to find silver linings. I know that that tends to be um, a fault of mine. I'm always trying to make lemonade out of lemons, and, and that is super annoying to my teenager. <laughs> Um, make sure you as adults and as parents are checking in daily with your students and with your children. Um, again, you know, I've had some kids in my practice that I'm like, why don't you just text your mom on a scale of one to 10, how you're doing? Um, just so your mom kind of has a gauge of how the depression is going. Give extra hugs, even to the teenagers, you know, they're not getting any type of physical contact at school anymore. And so make sure that, you know, you're, you're giving them those hugs. Um, be consistent with things like tucking in your kids at night. Um, you know, I know that we want to kind of unwind when we get home, but make sure that that they're getting again that that kind of daily check-in time. Share high fat or share highs and lows of the day. You know, around the dinner table, it's a great time to do that. What was good about today and what was bad about today? You know, sometimes it's that remote school is done, and sometimes it's that I get to go to school tomorrow, and that's great. Um, you know, but make sure you've got a, a space to do that. Make sure kids are staying off of the screen, that they've got dedicated time that is screen free. Kids are getting headaches, their eyes are hurting. Make sure that they've got time away from the screens. Um, centralized homework in a common location. You know, I have got several patients that, and I'm sure you guys know, but that are literally doing school in bed all day long and falling asleep halfway through, you know, the third class or whatever. Um, so get them out of their bed, tell them they've got to get dressed out of their pajamas, brush their hair, brush their teeth, put on deodorant. These are things that I tell my patients every day at work um, and centralize that homework so that there's a place that they're going and they're not just kind of disappearing under their covers. Um, have some accountability to that. Help kids organize classes and assignments. Make sure you're connecting with with teachers and parents alike so that everybody's on the same page, do things together as a family, have movie nights, game nights. I talked about family dinners already. And then make sure you are communicating with a parent or with a teacher if you notice that a student is struggling. And those are just some creative ideas. And I'm sure you guys have your own creative ideas as well and we would encourage that. So we've got to support schools um, through this pandemic. And we know that a strong and inclusive public school system is essential both to the short-term and the long-term recovery from this pandemic. Um, these kids are the future and we are, you know, this is affecting their education and, and their resiliency and their social emotional health. So make sure that we are supporting them now. Um, leaders need to consider ways um, that the long-term academic um, effects on the students. And so really providing as much safe on-site education as possible, 
um, is what we would recommend. And we've got to buffer the harms of long-term remote education. But that being said, it's got to be safe on-site education. And sometimes it's not safe to have on-site education. So really kind of focusing the resources, the space, the staff um, on allowing the younger kids to be in the buildings is where we are focusing our efforts. Um, and, and the navigating change um, updates allow for kids to continue on-site learning even in periods of high community transmission. And that may mean again, that we need to be creative and we need to be spreading out um, into different buildings. And the other thing that we have seen a lot is districts making decisions kind of district wide about whether schools um, stay in remote learning modes or move to on site learning modes and, and really consider this based on building level data rather than district wide. You know, some buildings are doing an excellent job with risk mitigation, while others maybe are not, or maybe there's a cluster in one school, and maybe you're able to keep some buildings open um, while closing others temporarily. Make sure that you're focusing on the students that are below or um, or lower on learning proficiency or otherwise are at risk because they are gonna require special attention and probably some on-site um, accommodations. And, and really even when community transmission is high and it's forcing us to do remote learning, we need to develop safe ways to bring high-risk students back into the building, um, either for individual education or for small group education, um, just to be able to counter effect, counteract the negative effects of, of the long-term remote education. And I know that 504 plans and IEPs allow for some of those accommodations, but we're even talking about the kids that may be struggling um, with mental health or with um, you know, social development, things like that. Um, we may need to be making more accommodations for those students. And, and I would encourage those students to reach out to their primary care physicians or providers as well um, to you know, get some ideas for support and ways that the school could potentially help them. Next slide, please. So supporting teachers and staff is also essential. Our teachers are essential to effective operations of schools. We have all seen schools shut down because we don't have teachers and staff available. We've seen staff members um, kind of, we would call it practicing out of their scope, but moving from one position into one that they're not as comfortable in um, to be able to fill these gaps. And so um, we really need to be able to support them um, in order to have effective, effectively operating schools. Teachers should be prioritized as essential workers um, in a positive way. These teachers have been doing exponential amounts of work since school shut down in the spring. Um, I know maybe I shouldn't quote him because he's on here, but I know my superintendent was joking the other day with a board member who said that, you know, it was the longest spring break ever. And, and he was saying, actually, it was the shortest spring break ever for me. I've been working nonstop since schools got shut down. And, and that is so true. Administrators, um, board of education members, teachers, you guys have all been working so hard and we are grateful for that. Um, we need to make sure that we're validating concerns um, when we have staff and teachers to have their concerns. We need to, again, just like we're providing a safe place for the students to express their concerns, we need to be um, doing that for the teachers and staff as well. We have to understand that the impacts of this pandemic are not short term, they are long term. Um, and so we need to be able to um, kind of creatively plan for the future um, beyond January and May and even August. We need to identify and address fears and barriers that are related to safety in the worst workplace. Again, validating those teachers' concerns. Um, staff have to have the resources to be able to provide or to be able to mask and provide social distancing for students um, in order to comply with safety measures. If we can't properly risk mitigate, then we need to have alternative solutions for safe education. And again, that may be remote, that may be hybrid, um, that may be using other buildings that are offsite. Um, from a healthcare standpoint, we want to prioritize educators for vaccine distribution. Um, we need them to be able to make our economies work. Um, and so uh, getting them vaccines early on in the distribution process is going to be important. And then um, just working together. I mean, it's awesome that you guys come together for this meeting. Like, how can we, um, you know, expand that into the teaching and, and allow for innovative models where we can do team-based teaching, where we can do multi-district virtual lessons in order to decrease the burden of simultaneously um, teaching in person and remotely. And then um, as far as testing goes, really being able to provide the on-site testing both for acute illness and for surveillance. Next slide, please. 
each student is, re is really experiencing this in a very unique way. And so we need to recognize that. Um, I know you guys know, but parents are working. I am sitting here with three kids at home, remote learning um, while I'm giving this presentation. And that means that I had to block my clinic and I'm not seeing patients. So understand that parents are working while they're trying to manage remote learners. Um, some are able to be at home and some are not, but everyone is distracted. Um, ensure assignments are appropriate and flexible. You know, it's, it's not um, developmentally appropriate to have a second grader. Um, only way to access the teacher is to email, right? They don't know how to email. <laughs> so just things like that. Um, encourage fun opportunities and mental health breaks. Um, really be consistent with routines. That's very, very important. Um, and I've seen that work well with, with my younger kiddos. Um, and then encourage opportunities for physical activity. And again, we've talked about screen time already. Next slide. Back to you, Dr. Coleman. Sorry, I could not unmute myself for a second. So kind of our call to action to you guys as leaders, we're really asking you guys to prioritize safety and health um, in, your, in your districts um, that you represent. Um, please help us promote risk mitigating efforts um, within the districts that you represent and within your circles of influence. Um, uh, I know you guys have been, but continue to support your school administrators, your teachers, your staff, um, and again, support the parents and the students. Um, one of the things we talk about in, in our healthcare and, um, is to share what works. So if you guys have identified um, within your districts things that are working well, things that are not working well, um, be sure to share with others. Um, we can always learn from each other um, and always um, utilize that information to, to make improvements in other areas. So we encourage you to share what works. Um, this is a letter, many of you guys may have seen this, we drafted a letter um, in, um, it, with our um, school administrators here in Sedgwick County um, and sent this letter out um, statewide as just kind of a call to the community to help support our schools, um, recognizing that, that schools are, are vital and critical to our communities. Um, and in doing so, asking, um, asking our communities to, um, uh, to pledge to adhering to risk mitigating behaviors, so wearing masks, maintaining um, physical distancing from others, avoiding large gatherings, washing hands, don't, don't go to work, don't go to places if you're not feeling well, um, you know, support your communities, but do other things like um, deliveries or carry out or, th or things like that. Um, and then um, just really, again, encourage um, encourage these risk mitigation strategies. This is a letter that we have as a Google document and it's kind of circulated throughout the state. And uh, we have the link if anybody wants to continue to uh, support this message and um, sign up for this, um, to have your name on this letter. And we'll continue just to um, share this letter throughout, um, uh, throughout our state as, as uh, we can, certainly can. So just to leave you guys with a quote, um, this was in a uh, JAMA article um, back this summer that we read that given that COVID-19 is um, likely to be the last large scale disruption, it is imperative to build a resilient education ecosystem so that learning can continue when in-person instruction might not be possible. At this critical moment, it is now more important than ever to invest in innovation such as education technology and leapfrog progress both now and during, or both now during COVID-19 and beyond. So I think making the most of this opportunity to really um, innovate and be creative in, in the ways that we can identify um, uh, things that may work for, for the future, because it certainly may be that we're not in this similar situation, or that we may find ourselves in this similar situation in the future. So again, we appreciate you guys and everything that you're doing to serve um, children in our state and to serve your communities. And um, I know this went a little longer than what we intended, but we will be here for questions and we can stay for a few minutes if you guys um, have questions. Thank you guys. Well, I've, I've been taking notes uh, feverishly as you've gone along and, and trying to combine some of the questions. There's some common, common themes with questions that emerged over here in the chat. 
Uh, one of them um, is probably uh, on a lot of people's mind is, is there a vaccine that's been developed specifically for children? Well, you were hearing a lot of talk about vaccine coming. Uh, is there any difference in vaccine for children versus adults? Um, so right now the main vaccines that are coming to Kansas and throughout the nation are the Pfizer and Moderna. Um, I think the Pfizer has been tested on kids down to 12 years old and they've had at least 100 kids. Um, but it sounds like we won't, it'll be past the summertime probably till we have enough vaccines to get towards um, really figuring out in kids and having good efficacy data on that. So even some um, pediatricians and infectious disease specialists have um, started kind of advocating for more testing of those in kids so that we this doesn't carry over too much into the next academic year from this one. Okay, uh, another theme that emerged with several of the, the questions and some people were dropping them to me privately so you may not, maybe don't see them is where do you, what's the recommendation? We know that elementary, the recommendation that moved forward was get our, get our elementary kids back in school. Where, what's the recommendation on middle school and high school? Because the data out there uh, maybe doesn't support a lot of transmission at that age as well. That was one of the questions that popped up there. A couple of questions popped up. Where, where are you guys at on recommending middle and high school? What, what mode of learning? Carrie, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I'm trying to find my unmute. So, you know, I wish we could give you an answer for that. Certainly middle and high school students act a lot more like adults in transmitting. We've seen um, young adults be critically ill from this. Um, and I saw a question in here um, about, you know, if we shut down schools and we're sending kids home, we're basically removing them from, from a building that is safe and that is practicing risk mitigation. And that's been a, a common theme of conversation that we've had in our KCWK meetings. Um, you know, we don't have a good answer for that. It really becomes, you know, risk versus benefit, which is how we determine so many things in medicine. And so I don't know that we can give you a great answer. It certainly seems like um, the high schools have been affected a lot more um, than the elementary schools. And it, it again, it just comes down to safe um, risk mitigation. If you can allow for physical distancing, if you can ensure masking um, and you have staff to provide safe onsite education, you know, of course we want kids to be back in school, but if you can't do those things, then we don't feel like they can be in school safely. Just to tack onto that too, I think what we see in the middle school and high, in high school levels are the classes change. So you're just intermixing more students. And so it's really hard to, court, to cohort the, those classes and, um, and it just makes, just makes it more challenging. So the elementary, they naturally cohort, they're not intermixing as, as much. And I also add, oh, go ahead, Christy. So we all have things to add. Extracurriculars also complicate things. So you've got a whole different group of kids gathering together, breathing heavily on each other after school. And um, so adding in the extracurriculars that most um, school districts are unwilling to give up, um, that also increases the risk in that age group significantly. And I was just going to say that some of our adult colleagues um, would tell us absolutely they think that on the state level, middle school and high school kids um, and the school spread and school based transmission with the critical numbers that we're seeing in our county hospitals and in our big city hospitals. Um, we need to do something dramatic for them because they've been on the front lines since March seen death upon death and have been short staffed. And um, so uh, we, I think it's still from our standpoint, you got to do this risk benefit and kind of work through this and see what's best for your community, but make really smart educated decisions. Um, but there's some people who think that even beyond us, there's some more dramatic things we need to do to, um, to get control of this in our state. A couple of follow-up questions related to masking. Uh, originally, there was some, some guidance out there around uh, not masking below a certain age group. I think one of the specific questions was in here, the district wasn't requiring masks K through four. 
as their what's the transmission rate with the mask versus without yeah. mask for that age group is the recommendation to mask K through four. Yes, the, the recommendation is to mask. Um, we we don't have great data on transmission. Um, you know, again, while you're all on here, I'd encourage you to um, fill out the survey that KDHE or have your districts fill out the survey that KDHE puts out just so we can be able to track some of that transmission because um, we don't have a consistent platform other than that across districts. And so we really are lacking data on what transmission looks like. But we do know from studies that kids can transmit um, and that they effectively wear masks. They're compliant with it and they don't really struggle with it. You know, when we made those recommendations way back before school started, I think the big concern was that kids aren't gonna wear their masks. Um, they're gonna take them off. They're gonna touch them all the time. They're gonna fling them across the room. And that just hasn't been shown to be true. The kids are you know, competent and resilient and they are doing a much better job wearing masks than, than adults are for the most part. Yeah. So what, some questions that were sent to me were masking like in, in PE class and during physical activity. Uh, is that a recommendation that you all uh, have. Yeah, and the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with new masking guidelines for sports um, this past week, and I don't know it by heart, but it's um, we want to mask in as many physical activities as we can if there's not a strangulation risk or suffocation risk with that. Um, and basically, if you're working out so hard that you're within a few minutes, you're your mask is completely drenched from the amount of face sweat that you have, then it's probably not worth it to mask because a, a wet mask isn't going to be as effective. But if you can still do that kind of mid-level PE kind of aerobic exercises with a mask on, do it. If you're wrestling, you probably shouldn't. If you're swimming in a pool, you shouldn't. Um, but at all other times, um, I think that's what is um, the most up-to-date recommendations um, yeah, I think so. that is um, true. And I think they're making more and more like athletic type material kind of mask out of almost the dry fit material too for, for athletes. Okay. So this one kind of keeps going down the path of activities. Uh, as you guys know, there's been uh, some recent decisions made by our High School Activities Association. Uh, a few weeks ago, the recommendation was no spectators. And then yesterday, um, I think it was yesterday, I've lost track of time. Um, They've, they've relaxed that a little bit to now two uh, adults per uh, athlete or, or participant. Where, where are you at with that? And, and what guidance would you give the folks on the call here about how to, how to go forward with that? Because um, they're, they're kind of struggling now how to deal with that. I'm just going to go on the record to say that was absolutely the wrong decision for Keisha to make. I feel like it pushed the decision to administrators, to school board members, to make a decision that they should have made. It is a high risk situation, filling a gym with people who don't wear their masks well, who refuse to socially distance so that they can watch their children in person, I think is irresponsible in the current state of our pandemic. Kids are going to lose the chance to play at all because everything is gonna have to shut down if we can't get a hold of these things. Yeah, at times of high transmission, we all ha also have high opportunity to be able to decrease transmission um, by making drastic decisions and sacrifices. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we are not, we are not unaffected by this. No you know, we all have kids. Okay, bye. We all have kids that um, are involved in, in activities and, you know, I've got two very disappointed children that aren't playing basketball this year and it breaks my heart because they thrive on that and I didn't let them do anything else and I was really hoping we could do basketball, but in a very um, low ventilated area, the more people that you increase, um, the more likely you are to, to make this go out of hand. And the other thing to think about is we don't have beds for athletic injuries right now either. I mean, our hospitals are full, period. There, there's no room. And our doctors are tired. You're getting a lot of love in the chat. I think, uh, I think the, the group that's on here is, is at least the majority of people chiming in or are in agreement with you guys with not 
passing that down to the local boards and administrators. I know they're 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 taking a beating on this one. I've taken several calls since the decision came out yesterday on how okay now how do I walk forward with this? Yeah, and um, we feel the weight on you guys, and you know we're sorry that you're in this position. Uh, yeah. Definitely. So I just have a few more questions here, and then we'll see if anything trickles in. Uh, has there been any changes to the research or the findings on how transmission happens on surfaces? I know initially there was a lot of a discussion about surfaces, and then we learned it was more aerosol. What, where are we at with that, or have there been any changes there? Paul. I don't know if there's been great concrete data to tell us what is more. Um, so we know that there can be transmission aerosol, there can be transmission on surfaces, and it, it's important to do all the things. Um, okay. Another question that I got sent privately to me, do, can you provide some guidance on how to handle uh, folks or individuals that are claiming that they've already had it, so therefore they do not need to mask. Any any tips or guidance you can share with the group of people on here? Because that, that seems to be a common response from people. We hope they're right. <laughs> you know, that would be great <laughs> to know that we had last seen immunity to this, but it's a brand new virus and we don't have great details on, on what immunity looks like and how long it's gonna last. Yeah, and there I are- put a mask on. There are documented cases of reinfection as well. Yeah. Okay. So, so. And we've uh, had documented, uh, we've had kids in our hospital who've had it twice or in our patient population at separate time with different, um, where they had negatives in between and they had symptoms. Yeah. And there's different and strains when we talk of this virus. Yeah. So, just because you've had one strain certainly doesn't mean that you're immune to another. Um, yeah, I would definitely think of it as influenza. I mean, it is very possible to have influenza, different strain, um, in the same in the same respiratory season. So this this would be no different. So so the the vaccine. There's a couple of questions that popped up related to vaccine. Number one, have you heard any discussion around uh, teachers being classified as essential? So so maybe getting an opportunity to be vaccinated a little bit sooner. And then there's some questions that have popped up over there in the chat related to vaccine that I'll let you address. So I believe, um, granted I haven't looked at the latest, but I believe what I saw from KDHE last week was that teachers would be in a tier two, that they um, put teachers in tier, or educators in tier two for vaccination distribution. Yeah, so tier one will be healthcare workers and the elderly and at risk older adults, and then um, and then some certain types of uh, infrastructure workers that are essential. And tier two with other types of essential workers, teachers are kind of in that mix of essential worker status. Um, we will get um, vaccines here in Kansas in the next couple of weeks. Um, I don't want to go in depth about what I've read about it. Um, but I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and thinking about it with a lot of um, our group and other physicians. And I, as soon as I have it available in my hospital for me to take as a healthcare worker, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go in and get the vaccine and get the second dose about 21 days later. Um, I think there's been, it's been a good process of how they've developed it from the basic science researchers who started it. And um, as much as there is some uncertainty about mRNA vaccines, there's tons that we know lots about it. Um, and that's as much as I'll say, so. So is there any um, concern about reinfection or the longevity of the immunity to the virus? I guess that's one of the questions that, that came up there related to the vaccine. Yeah, um, the if the different types of antibodies you have to pr produce that actually stay with you long term and fight the virus as it comes back, we don't know how long those will last in our bodies. Um, and if this is something that we have to do seasonally or not, um, but um, so we'll, the data will be out. But there's a lot of people from all levels of government and private sectors and academic sectors who are making sure this is gonna be successful. 
So there's a question in here related to a quarantine pass for three months. Um, I, what are your thoughts on, I, there was a couple of questions also about quarantine. There was a recent adjustment from 14 down to 10. Um, any thoughts, guidance you can share with these folks on, on that? Um, most of the quarantine recommendations come down to us from KDHE and most of the local health departments follow those fairly closely. KDHE allows someone to have a three month free pass after they've had a proven positive case of COVID. Um, and that's based on the idea that we think you might have immunity for three months. Um, and, and that'll change if we find out otherwise. Um, in terms of the modified quarantine, that's a CDC recommendation that KDHE did um, sort of endorse, but it falls to local health departments to um, make the ultimate determination county by county, which once again feels like things rolling downhill, right? Um, so your local health authorities will be the ones that will help guide the school districts in terms of how they can apply that adjustment in quarantine um, and isolation. The, um, just from a medical perspective, the disease didn't change any um, and so I just urge you to consider that when you're thinking about policies um, and who you apply them to as we understand the disease too. So if you choose to make those decisions in your district, you might apply them differently to teachers than you do to students um, and that sort of thing. But it gets pretty complex and I would encourage you to contact your local health department um, or local medical professionals to help kind of work through that. Additionally, getting one of one piece of the new guideline is testing during the quarantine period. Um, and that also gets very complicated and not all local health departments can facilitate that sort of um, adjustment and testing um, is not always available through the health department or managed by the health department. So you can see how that kind of complicated things, although it sounded nice on paper. Well, I think we'll we'll try to wrap things up there since, since we've run a little over on our time today. I really do appreciate uh, all of you jumping on here and providing your expertise and wisdom. Uh, I know you have been working a lot of long hours and, and, and grinding through this, and, and we appreciate everything that you've done, not only in your local hospitals, but also for uh, the work you've done around the Navigating Change document and helping provide some great guidance as, as that document was put together. So a couple of things as we wrap up here, don't forget on Friday, we have our advocacy update. Uh, that's Mark Tallman, Leah Flyter, and Scott Rothschild. They'll be jumping on to talk about the recent legislative leadership elections. And then we also have the State Board of Education today debating and discussing their legislative priorities. So they're gonna give you some analysis and breakdown of that, as well as some interim committee updates, uh, committees that have been meeting in between the sessions. So. Those are the things that are coming up on Friday. Don't forget to register for that. And then our next Lunch and Learn session will be January 20th, um, the new year, 2021. So hopefully uh, 2021 will be a little bit better year for us. We do appreciate all of you jumping on today. And thank you for your service to the kids of Kansas. Have a good day.